In this video, we're gonna discuss the topic of hypothyroidism, how to tell if you might need thyroid medication, and how to interpret your thyroid labs. Hey guys, we're back again with Justin Groce of the Restore Clinic. Um, so Justin, you are our thyroid guy in that Facebook group we're in. A lot of clinics that are doing testosterone replacement therapy, but for guys who are hypothyroid and need thyroid medication, that's not usually their type of thing. And they end up sending a lot of those guys to you because you're kind of like our, our, our Yoda on the thyroid uh, side of things. So I just want to go over some of the fundamentals here. Um, how would one know that they may be hypothyroid? Is it strictly by labs or do you go by how, how they feel and their symptoms? So that could be a, a question of rhetoric. I could say, how does one know if, <clears throat> excuse me, if they have low testosterone? Um, similarly, it's, it's not cut and dry. It's not, okay, here's the ranges. Here's where you fall. Okay, you qualify, you don't. Just like with low T, um, hypothyroidism similar we play it based on what does your blood work present us and what corroboration does it have with the symptoms that you express now that's a good segue symptomology guys if you've got um, hypothyroidism if you suspect it some of the the principal symptoms you may experience are um, edema Primarily like uh, pre-tibially, like uh, lower extremities, especially around the, the ankle, the sock line. Um, your skin quality would be compromised. Uh, it's going to tend to be drier. Your nails are not going to be the same. They're not going to have that good, strong integrity. Hair quality, dry, brittle. Again, it's going to be compromised. And one thing we also sometimes see is the brows. There may be some thinning on the brows, especially in that third outer lateral portion, that may wear away. Um, some periorbital facial swelling, some facial edema, especially like right around the eyes, it's, it's called periorbital. Cognitive changes, just like low testosterone. Brain fog is a big one. Another one, depression. Um, that's why one reason why psychiatrists have historically off-label given thyroid medication to patients that are uh, suffering from treatment refractory depression because guess what? The thyroid is responsible for the serotonin, not to mention dopamine as well. Constipation is another one that a lot of people will deal with. Um, vague abdominal complaints. Um, in women, <clears throat> in women, it can actually disrupt their menses. Not to mention uh, if women have hypothyroidism, it can lead to miscarriages. So those are some of the principal side effects they look for or not side effects, but symptoms. Now, with the blood work, principally and historically, you'd, you go to your primary care, you say, hey man, um, I, I, I do think I may have hypothyroidism. Can you evaluate me? Well, they'll pull a TSH, but what that does is that's just a signaling hormone. That's no different than, say if you go to your doctor and say, I think I got low T and they pull an FSH LH. What the hell does that tell you? It just tells you there's a communication between the brain and the balls, whereas the TSH is communication between the thyroid and the brain. That doesn't tell you what's going on underneath. So that's the first thing they'd look at. It's typically, you know, from one to four, depending what lab you go to, or 0.4 to four would be the traditional ranges, again, depending what lab you go to. That's what they'd look at. And they'd say, uh, here, well, they got this range right here. <clears throat> you know, that's, you, you fall in the range, you're good. But was there, any, was there any mention of the symptoms that we talked about? Hmm, probably not. Uh, do you wake up cold? You do? Okay. Start measuring your axillary temps first thing in the morning. Constipation? Well, that's a possibility. Do those numbers corroborate with your symptoms? So other testing you should have done would be the free T3 and the free T4 because the TSH communicates brain to thyroid. The thyroid picks that up. The thyroid would then make free T3 and free T4 in response to that. Just like low T, FSH and LH tells your balls, make testosterone. So if you've got high levels of TSH and fairly low levels of free T3, free T4, explain what that implies to, to guys just so they, they understand. Mm -hmm. 
So if that TSH is climbing up, that's your brain. It's, it's turning up the volume, turn up the volume in an effort in hopes that the thyroid will hear that. So it's going to crank up, crank up, crank up. And then eventually when you hit what we call overt hypothyroidism, that TSH goes up, nothing comes out. That means the T3 and the T4 numbers will be low. Now, <clears throat> there's a condition called subclinical subclinical hypothyroidism. That's where the TSH is marginally elevated. The, by, the, by the textbook standards, they'd say, you know, between 4 and 10. However, your free T3 and free T4 levels will still be adequately produced. So that's like kind of saying, that's a subclinical. That's kind of like saying you haven't quite gotten there. But <clears throat> in my experience, what I see, if you're subclinical, you're going to get there. I mean, the burnout is happening. The brain is already cranking out its TSH production, and the thyroid is actually still making it in response to that, but it's taking just a little more effort from the brain to get that communication going. It's just a matter of time. If you are subclinical, you will become overt. At what time, how long it'll be, we don't know. Everybody's different. But if you are subclinical, you will get there at some point. So the, the way it was originally explained to me, and you tell, you'll correct me if I'm wrong here, was that if TSH is fairly close to one, and your free T3 levels are decent, what that implies is that there's very little signaling that's required and your body is making sufficient thyroid. However, if they're seeing elevated TSH, let's say when I'm saying elevated, anything, below, anything like three and above, regardless of where the levels are of your free T3, what it means is that your body is is asking for more. So I'll make an example. You've got your TSH at three and your free T3 is sitting at five. You know, I mean, let's say you're even your TSH is at three and a half, your free T and your free T3 is at five. I was always told that even though your free T3 levels are considered optimal, mm -hmm. because your TSH is, is, is fairly elevated, it means that the body is, is actually needing more of it and trying to produce more, and that's why the, the, the signaling of TSH continues. Is that an accurate? That'd be a, that'd be a compensatory response. So yes, it, so okay. So say like the TSH is on the low side, you know, it's on the good side, it's one or one or two, and your T4, T3 look good. Okay, cool, you're, 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 you're a efficient, well-oiled machine. It takes right. very little to get the damn job done. Now, like on the second scenario, you said like, um, correct me if I'm wrong, you said if the TSH is just like, on the upper end of normal, is that correct? Yeah. But like the free T3 is also on the upper end? Yes. Okay, so in that scenario, typically what we'd see is that that's more of like a compensatory response. The TSH is going up and your body's doing everything it can with that loud signals receiving. It's being yelled at and it's working overtime to pump out what it can um, as a comp compensatory response. So yes, that is correct, what you're saying. Okay, so that just means that the, the, the free, there's enough, there's sufficient 3T3 being made, but the body's probably having to work a little harder oh, yeah. than oh, it yeah. should. It's not, the, the production of it isn't as efficient as someone who has mm -hmm. a lower level of TSH. That is correct. But that, does that necessarily imply that the person might benefit from getting on thyroid? Like the fact that it's still, mm -hmm. that it's struggling, if you will, to create thyroid and free T3 levels are, are, are great, would that be a, a reason to say, let's put you on thyroid because obviously your body's having, is struggling to make the amount of thyroid it needs or would you just kind of leave it alone or? They, so when I see stuff like that, it eventually does burn out. It does. Okay. So what okay. you could actually do, you could go ahead and, and put them back on and say, if you did start them on some thyroid medication, say that TSH is like five, that free T3 is like 3.5, four, you know, they're both in, on the upper side. You put it on the medication, that TSH will come back down. And then that free T3, over time, you'll build the dose up and build it back up. So yes, um, just like you're saying, the brain's working harder, it's yelled at it, and the body's busting ass to pump out what it can of that free T3. So yes, I, in that case, a lot of times you would treat them, especially if they're symptomatic, man. I don't give a damn. If that, if that free T3 is you're cruising at 3.5, but that TSH is, you know, 4 or 5, and they, their they're check mark textbook of all the symptoms, what's it gonna hurt? Empirically treat them. Right. Um, what about, so a lot of guys out there that are looking at thyroid, they know about the TSH and they know about the free T3. Where <clears> they get confused is, say for example, you've got 
maybe high levels of free T4, lower levels of free T3 or, or vice versa. Can you just shed a little bit of light on on someone that they're saying, oh, how come my, this one is optimal, but this one is deficient or, or the other way around? So uh, historically the the free T4, the T4 is your pro hormone. It's uh, what's convert over down to T3. So say if you like topped off on one, but lower on the other, like say, T4 is higher, T3 is low, then you're not adequately converting. So that could be could be an issue of deiodinases. Um, in deiodinases, there's, there's three enzymes, D1, D2, D3. D1, D2 is responsible for the conversion of T4 into T3. D3 is responsible for the conversion of T4 into reverse T3. Um, they're also known as selenodeiodinases because, well, their, their backbone of the enzyme is selenium. So a lot of times in these patients, yeah, if you get them adequate selenium, a lot of times you can help fulfill and provide them with the, the backbone for the enzymes they need to more efficiently, naturally convert in that process. Okay, so guys that are having kind of borderline issues with thyroid, would, is supplementing with selenium just considered a best practice thing for them to start with by default? Or? I recommend all the thyroid patients too. I mean, hell, if you're gonna be on the medication, <clears throat> if you're hypothyroid, you're obviously not converting worth right. a damn in the first place. Right. So it's not going to hurt to put them on selenium. I, I right. think, you know, every thyroid patient should be on it in conjunction with their thyroid medication so that they can have a more efficient process in terms of um, enzyme conversion or, um, I mean, hormone conversion. Okay. And for the reverse T3 and reverse T4, when do you typically look at that? Like, do you just mostly look at the TSH, free T3 and free T4 and judge based on that? Or do you mm -hmm. always test the reverse stuff as well? And if not, when when would be a time for you to test reverse T3 and reverse T3-4 and, and, and why? I don't I don't test reverse T3. No? Okay. Um, so, I mean, reverse T3 goes up in conditions of what, of stress, like um, even caloric restriction, illness, high stress situations. Um, a lot of these patients, they have an underlying illness. They have an underlying comorbidity. It's naturally gonna be high. When you treat them, it tends to self-resolve, tends to correct itself. Okay. But what, is the, what does the reverse T3 tell us that we don't already know? If it's high, they're stressed. I mean, hell, you get that from the patient during the clinical encounter. You talk to them, they'll tell you what's going on. Mm -hmm. It's like, I would already know that your reverse T3 would be elevated, but it's not gonna change the outcome. The outcome is that you treat the patient, treat the symptoms, and follow their blood work in corroboration with what they're telling you. Got it, got it. I ask because I get, I mean, People send me their labs all the time and I'm always checking them out and I try to look at for patterns and try to look for, um, and I do see that every now and then a um, lab that gets sent to me where the doctor's checking TSH, free T3, free T4, reverse T3, reverse T4. And I, I always question, okay, what what's the reasoning of checking this out? Uh, I, I wondered if it really was useful information or if it was the equivalent of doctors checking for LH and FSH from it on TRT, like it was just useless information. I mean it doesn't change the clinical outcome or it doesn't really change your direction in terms of treating the patient. It's just kind of, in my opinion, it's kind of an antiquated test, really. I mean, like I said, if they're in a state of stress, if they're ill, if they have comorbidities, if they're older, it's going to be higher. Hell, uh, roughly 40% of your T4 medication converts to it anyway. So if you got them on 100, you know that 40 micrograms is going to convert over to reverse C3. If you got them on 200, so regardless, you raise the dose up, there's gonna be more converting over to reverse C3 anyway, so it doesn't change anything. Right. Okay. That's just kind of my thought. But. Do you work with guys that are, they're not necessarily hypothyroid, but they're just kind of like with the testosterone side of things, how do I get things optimal? I'm, you know, maybe I'm right in the middle. I don't necessarily have any symptoms, but let me see if I can optimize thyroid for the, whatever the reason. Uh, <clears throat> it's not something you do and what's your approach to, to that if, if you even do it. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> it, it'd be similar, say if a guy comes to me and his testosterone you know, is 400, he's normal range, but at the same time, he's complaining of symptoms. Do we treat them? Sure, yeah, we, we treat them. Same, same concept. Somebody comes to me and they've got some clinical symptoms. They're complaining of symptoms. The blood work's still, you know, it's I, it's not great, it's not optimal. Sure, we'll work with them and empirically try. Yeah, I've got a, quite a few guys like that. Guys, Justin Groce from the Restore Clinic. Okay. Got the link listed right over here. Yes, sir. Um, definitely check it out. It takes care of, uh, was it eight states or seven states? Eight, currently. Old man short-term memory issues. <laughs>
Thanks again, Justin. Always a pleasure. Yes, thank you. Thank you.